All right, and welcome back to the Paraglider Show. This is Gabriel and David Jeb. We're broadcasting live, and we're online presently with Murray. Welcome back, Murray. I've got to say the webcam's great for saving on your phone bills. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, isn't it? <laughs> it's funny. Right, like, they're back, they're back. Phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You, you know, it's funny because like, I, I'm just, I, I find myself sitting here watching us in the studio going, man, that's really cool. That's really, really cool, you know? <laughs> so it's a, it's a good thing, man. Okay, so we're, t- we're talking uh, paragliding landings, and, and our goal is to uh, make uh, a landing in a safe and uh, proper uh, position, flaring at the proper time, the proper height, uh, timing, touching down uh, in, in, a, in a gentle, nice, easy manner. And uh, we want to we try to talk about the kinds of things that one should be thinking about when coming in for a landing and making it a, a safe landing. Yeah, Murray already mentioned it, the wind direction. Um, most of the times, most of the places you'll fly, you always come in with a little bit of wind. It's a lot easier landing into it than absolutely. Than and you know, it's, a, it's surprising, Gabriel, to me how many times we go to a site and we stand at launch and then drive on up and nobody's even got a windsock out or anything. Sometimes mm. in our area, Murray, I don't know about yours, but um, it's a little bit difficult because we just have low-lying brush or shrubbery, chaparral, and uh, dirt and dust. And uh, oftentimes you don't have the benefit of seeing, you know, trees swaying or or these kinds of things, and it makes it harder to tell wind direction. And there can be quite a bit of wind blowing, and you can feel it, but sometimes if you're new, you may not be precisely aware of the exact direction the wind's coming from at the LZ. So flags help. Yeah, that's one of the things, well, it's not something anybody wants to see, but the odd bits of plastic caught in bad wire fences, you know, all the, the rubbish that seems to blow around the countryside for people that can carry a full package to wherever they're going, but can't be bothered carrying back the empty package. But I must admit, from the flying point of view, sometimes, you know, that's a good safety benefit. But the, the other thing which we do a lot of is you find a small 20-foot high ridge, and you can do 50 takeoffs and landings in an hour which obviously means you're constantly on key. So if it's not a great day for going flying on a big site, nip out to your local site, right. have a few hours having some fun. It's right. fun. You might not have flown eight hour, but you've flown a total of an hour in you know, 50 flights. Right, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, in, in general aviation, in military aviation, particularly in Navy aviation, um, this is what these guys do all day long is practicing yeah. touch and go on the top of the carrier deck, which is a very precise small landing area, and this requires a lot of practice. And it's the same thing with paragliding because uh, although we're not landing on top of a carrier deck, very few of us have the luxury of having a great big, huge, huge, wide open space to land in. In fact, usually it's some space has been carved out in a forest or in, a, in an area where there's shrubbery and so on. On, and so you have to hit that uh, landing area, and it takes quite a bit of concentration. Uh, I think one of the big problems with uh, landing is that oftentimes there's many, many distractions that are going on, and the pilot will lose his focus momentarily on wind direction, on ground speed, airspeed, um, uh, distractions, other people landing in front of him, uh, some coming in from above him. You know, these are all uh, things that have to be factored in. And how do you stay focused? And what are some of the things you can do to prevent uh, having a problem at landing? One of the things I was going to mention is, is a lot of sites you go to, like at Marshall or at Horse or, or some of the mountain sites that we have, um, it'll shut down at, at pretty much at the same time right, of day. Right, so you've right. got pilots that have been up all day long, and all of a sudden it's a mad rush to the They're LZ. They're all flooding in 20, 25 of them at a time. W- one of the things that I think uh, you as pilots can do is uh, you take the initiative to, uh, to, to get down as quickly as you can. Um, I, I see too often a lot of pilots trying to, you know, sl- wait to the last minute. Yeah, yeah, you know, either because they want to get the, the the last lift or because you know they just don't really know what to do. There's eight guys down a little bit below them and in front of them. Uh, but I found that it's always more confusing because nobody can really gauge what anybody else's sink rate is. Versus if you just go down and and make a concerted effort to pull big ears or do a, a spiral or some wingovers or something like that to get down. At least you're getting out of everybody else's yeah. way. You're always better being on the ground five minutes early than in the next life five minutes early. Right. <laughs> well, can you hear a sort of alarm sound on the phone? Yeah. 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 I think it might be coming from my end. What I'm going to do is hang up and dial back in. Okay. 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 Okay, Mary. Well, we'll be ready for you when you come back. 
And uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, you know, uh, coming into the pattern because the pattern oftentimes is going to be a part of uh, a part of a problem. Uh, getting in too late uh, when everybody else is trying to get in all at once. You got 25 guys uh, hitting a small uh, postage stamp LZ, and uh, that kind of creates a problem. But let's there's several things that we want to be conscious of when we're setting up for a pattern. One is don't drop in on a pattern uh, necessarily. You know, uh, you might see two or three guys that are already set up for their landing approach and uh, somebody drops right into the middle of it uh, and uh, kind of cuts in front of the line, you might say. That sometimes can create a, a problem. The other thing is don't make the patterns too huge. In other words, um, usually we set up in the landing area and oftentimes you'll see guys that go way too far on one of their runs and they end up not uh, and then turning into the wind and they sink out behind the bushes because they were too far uh, but deep in their pattern. Having having said that, though, a lot of pilots make the mistake of just like making real small tight right, right, turns, right. you know, because they're they're just focused in on, a, on a small narrow right. area. So you can see there's the it, dynamics it's a fine involved. line. Yeah. yeah. So you don't you don't go way way deep on your pattern. And you don't come in too shallow either. Right. Um, the other thing is um, I, redundant, but th this butting in problem oftentimes is a problem. Uh, one of the things that you have to remember is that the the landing approach, the person that's lower or lowest has right away. In other words, uh, yeah. I, I remember one incident where a couple. 10 or 15 paragliders were coming into the landing. We were all set up in a pattern and we we're all flying at a paraglider normal speed and all of a sudden a hang glider comes dropping in at about 40 miles an hour and uh, jumps in front of the pattern, jumps in and it made everybody's pattern shaky for a few minutes. That can be a problem. So try not to butt in when you're setting yourself up for getting into this pattern. Um, space. Space becomes very important as well. Spacing your distance between the guy in front of you. The right. And, so and, see, that, and that's the point I was going to bring in it, is if you're flying with a lot of people, it probably makes sense to do wider turns and slower turns because, and use up more space because it's a lot easier to keep a lot of people in line that way, and you'll be uh, causing causing a lot less wake. Particularly if there's an obvious ground feature that you can use as the the points for your circuit. If right. everybody just sticks to those, then you don't have people cutting across each other. Right. Absolutely. And so you use the local scenery, the local furniture as, you know, quite a clear distinct, don't just for the sake of it go longer or go shorter, if there's an obvious point that would make a good turning point, do that, unlike somebody walking down the pavement, I don't know if you get the same thing in the States, but if somebody steps to the one side, then everybody else, you know, uh, sorry, not driving along the road and there's a cyclist, if one, if the first driver pulls out to give the cyclist plenty of room, everybody behind them will do the same thing. Right. So, I mean, even if they don't realize it, a lot of people will go with common sense. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay, so one of the other comments maybe you can take uh, some discussion on. Landing skills uh, take time to develop because the timing clues are very subtle. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah. Timing clues. Yeah. In other words, th th one of the things we were talking about is how do you train somebody. Well, one of the thing is um, we're we're learning as new pilots uh, to to adapt to a changing fluid environment, and these clues oftentimes are very very subtle. For instance, uh, uh, one of the things that a new pilot has to understand when making a landing, he has to understand what wind gradient is and how it affects the landing approach. Mm, particularly if you're landing in the lee of trees. You suddenly get that, whoa, my ground speed has just picked up. Right, right. Yeah, and, and it can go both ways. It may get a little bit lighter as you're yeah. as you're going down, or it may get stronger if you're coming down into a, a venturi, like in a valley system right. or so. Um, and that's something that, yeah, you don't often um, take into consideration when you're still out. So let's talk a little bit about this wind gradient, maybe so that some of the people that may be listening will change or will understand what we are talking about. It it, it means that basically, um, as you're as you're dropping in and getting closer to the ground, because of the ground friction, the air is moving over this uh, uh, rough, coarse, uh, tree-infested terrain, oftentimes it reduces the air speed and consequently... Wind speed. Uh, wind speed, excuse me, yeah. and consequently um, this is going to change some of the, the characteristics of your yeah. of your landing. You know, the, the three winds generally assume to be at 2,000 feet. At 2,000 feet above the surface, the wind will follow the isobars. As you get down with right. Coralis, it will actually change in direction as well as strength. And they reckon that over water, so if you're flying a coastal site, effectively the wind you're flying in has been over water, even if you're over land. Over water, it will only reduce by about 30% and 10 degrees. But over land, 
it can easily reduce by 50% and you know, a much larger degree amount. I can't remember the exact figures, but there's, there's a noticeable difference. So you get both the change in strength and a noticeable backing of the wind in the northern hemisphere. So it'll go anti-clockwise in magnetic direction. Right. Well, Gabriel, okay, so Gabriel, what happens uh, when we enter in wind gradient? What happens with airspeed r- reduces? The wind, wind speed, speed the wind speed drops, and okay. effectively we've got uh, a longer glide because there's less less resistance right. per se. And so um, uh, w- the thing that I notice the most with the students is they tend to overshoot the LZ if they're coming into yeah. an area where um, uh, where there's not much wind. And uh, and they're used to maybe having a little bit more wind at launch, or maybe they're just not paying attention to the fact that the wind's dying down. You very rarely see people undershooting. Right. Uh, and and the second... Overshooting. Well, but see, uh, here here locally we've got a couple of sites that are, that are just the opposite, where w- that we land in valley systems. And so you'll have essentially no wind at launch, and you'll come in um, and land, and there'll be a 15, 15 mile an hour wind. And so um, what happens then is then they end up undershooting because they're they're used to setting up, mm. and 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 you know as we were saying, uh, generally we overshoot uh, when we're coming in through the, the the gradient, and so they'll they'll set up, and all of a sudden we're in a venturi, which. Again, to a new pilot, the, the, the subtle differences may not right. be as obvious. And these subtle differences uh, oftentimes do take quite a bit of uh, practice and, and uh, working at to feel and develop a sense for. What, what about the stall dangers of uh, coming in? As, you, as, you're, as you're up above uh, Murray, 2,000 feet, you've got a lot of air flowing over the wing. And as you come down and you start getting closer to the ground, what, how, how does that affect stall characteristics? Well, it makes no difference because it's your airspeed that's key, not your wind speed. Right. Well, oftentimes, though, what happens is when you get into this gradient, you start feeling less wind. Um, you, start, uh, you start getting a little bit more on your brakes. What happens? Well, then you put yourself in more danger of stalling, but I, I, I don't think it's... I think it's because people are, are confusing the ground speed with their yeah, airspeed. Definitely. Um, where they're where they're traveling either with a, a partial tailwind or maybe they were they were up higher and they just didn't have as much ground reference and so they, they felt like they were flying slower. So you get the ground rush. Right, exactly. As soon as the ground comes up close to you, all of a sudden things start happening really quickly. Um, and you know, you see perfectly good landing approaches um, you know blown because they 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 start to uh, I, I don't know people start to get real excited when the ground gets close so uh, one of the things we do is with our fist punch down hard on something and then do the same thing but as a skimming punch and say to folks well what would you rather do would you rather tuck and roll and hit the ground horizontally at 30 miles an hour or mm-hmm. would you rather drop vertically and hit it at 10 and you sort of you know, really hammer home this point if you slow down and lose your airspeed right. it's going to hurt you one hell of a lot more hitting the ground at 10 miles an hour than it will tucking and rolling at 30 right absolutely yeah, and you know that's that's actually just another good point right there. Is if you are coming in downwind, uh, don't change it. <laughs> yeah. Just keep going with it because as you start to turn and try and turn back into the wind, especially with the wind at your back, uh, you'll be making a much harder turn, which means your body's going to be swinging out more, and so you have more acceleration in your impact, body. Yeah. yeah. Ground impact is going to be a little bit harder. Well, listen, we're we're kind of coming up to the top of the break, Marie, so we're going to have to knock it off here and, yeah. and and get these advertisers in to make us some money. Uh, I've got to do the same thing. I better get back to work. Okay, one last bye. thing, just before I disappear, though, there was a very good MSN from one of our lads, and he was pointing out that a lot of pilots who then become qualified and move up a wing don't go back and don't do all the training they need to redo. Absolutely. Yeah, You're get right. used to landing with a new glider. Yeah. All the best, Jen. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Murray.